I think we'll get started. So let me first of all, let me first of all welcome you this evening. I'm Sheila Brown, Mount St. Vincent's Academic Vice President, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Dr. Nina Colwell. Dr. Colwell will deliver the Nancy Roll Jackman Lecture in Women's Studies. Let me start by telling you a little about our speaker this evening. Dr. Colwell hails from Manitoba, where she taught for 13 years in the Faculty of Management at the University of Manitoba. It was there that I first met Nina and became acquainted with one of her three books, The New Partnership, Women and Men in Organizations, in which she looks at sex role differences and stereotypes within organizations and how we address those crucial issues. In the dedication, in the frontispiece of that book, Nina hoped that for the children of the 1980s, the book would be history before they were old enough to understand it. Unfortunately, we know that in many organizations, those stereotypes are still perpetuated and the work of commentators and scholars like Dr. Colwell is still much needed. Nina also has a great interest and expertise in communication, in the use of language, and the subtle and not so subtle meanings it conveys. I remember hearing her speak many years ago about gender neutral language. And at that time, people would argue, as I suppose some still do, well, you know, it's not a big issue. It doesn't matter if we refer to, to women by the general title uh, men or mankind. It's not a big issue. It doesn't matter. Nina's response was, well, if it doesn't matter, why are you getting so worked up when we try to change it? Nina left the University of Manitoba in 1990 to pursue other directions, although she remains an adjunct professor there. She formed her own company, Decision Research, and works as a management consultant, seminar leader, and writer. Her areas of specialization are communication, leadership, power, or lack thereof, research methods, and sex differences. She's much sought after to speak about those topics, and she gives regular seminars at Cranfield University in England. She's written over 40 articles and book chapters, and in 1987, she was honored by Touche Ross Management Consultants for her Women in Business articles in Business Quarterly. Dr. Colwell's very well-traveled and brings many national and international perspectives to all her work. We're delighted to welcome her to Mount St. Vincent this evening, and it's my pleasure to invite her to deliver this evening's lecture, Where Have We Been? Where Are We Going? A Model of Gender Role Change. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nina Colwell. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I'm very proud to be asked to this, to be the first in the series um, of lectures that you're going to be having this year. And I'm very pleased to be in Halifax for a couple of reasons. I really enjoy the city of Halifax, and, I, and I've enjoyed watching it develop over the 50 years that I've come and gone here. I actually lived in Dartmouth from the time I was two till the time I was four. And my first real memories come from Dartmouth. I remember we had a one, my mom and dad and I had a one room apartment across the street from a bookstore. I remember that very clearly. I remember some of the neighborhood children taking me to see Lassie come home. And I got hysterical halfway through and they had to drag me out and they were so angry because they, they had to miss the half of the show and so my mother gave them money so they could go back the next day. Um, and I remember listening to the trains and listening to the ships 
the ship's horns. And Halifax seemed like such an adventure to me, an adventurous city. When I was four, we moved to Hamilton, and my parents were really excited because this was my dad's first job at, since the war. He had been going to college in, in Halifax. And they were going to have a new house, their, the first house that they had owned. So for them, it was a very exciting time. But for me, at four, what, all I knew is that I was being taken out of this city of high adventure and being taken to a place that was very pragmatic. And so I still have this part of me that longs to get back to Halifax whenever I have the chance. But that was a long time ago. And the story I'm going to tell you today begins when I was 22. When I was 22, I read The Feminine Mystique. And if I were to tell you that Betty Friedan changed my life, you would have no way of knowing what an understatement that is. But this is 1995, and that was 1966, and I didn't know that every sentence I read was going to have a profound effect on my future. I didn't know that Betty Friedan had set me on a path, the path from which there is no returning. I didn't know that because of Betty Friedan, I was going to believe things and meet people and have experiences and be involved in situations that would shape my life in a way that I could never have imagined. I didn't even know that I was on a new path. All I knew is that I was confused and I was scared. I had what in those days was called a nervous breakdown. I was completely immobilized. I took a leave of absence from my job and I slept for 16 hours a day. I watched television, I slept, and I cried. And for those of you who have been working for 16 hours a day since terms started, that might sound like a lot of fun, but it does actually get boring after a while. And so I decided that it was time to go to a psychiatrist and get cured. And within a few weeks, I was pronounced cured. <laughs> when I was able to see that my real problem was jealousy, then my psychiatrist told me that our sessions could end. I was a high school dropout. I was earning $70 a week. And I was jealous of my husband, Dennis, who was making plans to quit his job and get an MBA. And the solution to my jealousy? The solution was to throw myself wholeheartedly into femininity, to create a world so feminine that I would never be jealous of a man again. I remember our talking about cakes, my psychiatrist and I. He suggested that I learn to bake tasty cakes. But it wasn't to stop there. That was already the beginning. I was learn to learn to create cakes, to learn to decorate cakes, to learn to present cakes to my guests, and then to wallow in their praise. And with that, he rose to his feet and shook my hand and handed me a new prescription for Valium and Librium. And I went back to work. I was a public relations rep in those days. And within a week, I had rolled the company Mustang. And I was lying in my hospital bed, and my psychiatrist came to visit me. And I thought, how sweet. He had heard about me on the evening news. But the purpose of his visit wasn't a social one. The purpose of his visit was to tell me that I could be charged with drug driving and to make sure that the police didn't know that I was taking both Valium and Librium. Obviously, I didn't know that. And so I decided that day that I'd taken my last Valium and my last Librium, and I was going to look for another cure. And this time, the process was a lot slower. This time, I talked to people, and I read, and I considered, and I thought about things, and I talked some more, and I had a baby. 
And by this time, Dennis had finished his MBA, and he was teaching at the University of Saskatchewan, and I was beginning to meet some academics. Three years had passed, and slowly a plan was emerging. A new cure was being formulated. Slowly, I was beginning to recognize the path that Betty Friedan had set me on. Betty Friedan had looked at women through the eyes of a sociologist. I wanted to be able to see women and men through the eyes of a psychologist from a more micro perspective, to do psychological research and to evaluate psychological research and to summarize psychological research in books in ways that people could understand who weren't psychologists. I wanted to be a psychologist, and so that's what I did. And that's why I've spent the last quarter century researching and evaluating and summarizing and writing and consulting and lecturing. But this evening, I want to stray a little bit. This evening, I want to talk to you about what I believe and about what I feel. I'm going to talk about my experience of the past and about my dreams for the future of women and men. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the roles that you and I have played the roles we are playing, and the roles that we're going to play in molding the future. <clears throat> Let's begin by looking at a basic concept, a concept so basic, a belief so basic, that it's become the building block of all sex discrimination. This building block is an assumption, an assumption that's been shared for centuries by virtually every culture on this planet. The assumption that men, the things that men do, and all things masculine, are superior to and more valuable than women, and the things that women do, and all things feminine. Now, when billions of people around the world hold a common belief as basic as this one, and they hold it for centuries, there are bound to be many and varied ramifications. Some of these ramifications are a matter of life and death, like bride burning, female infanticide. Some of these ramifications are life changing, like rape, like clitorectomies. And some of them, like a woman's name change at marriage, may appear to be innocuous. But all of these implications stem from one assumption, the superior value of men and all things masculine. Now, I want to make two things clear at the beginning. One is that I don't believe for one moment that only men have believed in the superiority of men. Never in the written history have men had a monopoly on male chauvinism and they don't today. Nor do I believe that life for men and boys is necessarily a rosy one. There are many responsibilities at the top. It's true that the differential value of men and women means that men's work is paid better than women's work and that men are paid better than women. But it also, theoretically at least, gives men greater financial responsibility than it gives to women in many situations. And it also requires men to protect women, to be the last on the lifeboat and the first on the front line. It hasn't always happened that way, but that's the theoretical model. Those are the rules, at least in our culture. And the rules afford men fewer positive and socially acceptable emotional outlets, like crying, like self-disclosure. Men are superior to women. Men are more valuable than women, and they've played a high price to occupy that position. Most of the men I know have paid a higher price to be a man than I would ever want to pay to be a woman. Men have learned roles that are even more stringent and even more restrictive than women's roles, and their punishment for defying these roles are harsher. Women can discard many elements of the complexity that we call the female role, and incorporate many elements of the male role, and they can do it with impunity. For women to emulate men is for women to better themselves. 
And that's a fine thing to do in an achieving society like ours. So women become ministers and play football and support families. And although some people may disapprove, most people today would consider women to have a, such women to have achieved something, to have achieved something beyond their role. The reaction hasn't been quite as positive for the men who become nurses or crochet Afghans or adopt gestures or modes of speech that we consider to be feminine. Women are inferior to men, and to emulate one's inferiors in an achieving society smacks of perversion. But not everyone believes this. Not everyone believes this basic assumption of their culture that males are superior to and more valuable than females. Some people, like the people here today, presumably believe no such thing. They don't believe that men are more valuable than women, that boys are more valuable than girls. They believe if they ever consciously consider people in the context of their value, that males and females are equal in value. I call these people feminists, and I call myself a feminist. But we don't have to call ourselves anything in order to support equality and, and fair treatment for women and men. So here we have it. A group of people that rejects a centuries-old universal norm, a group that doesn't believe that men are wor worth more than women. Sometimes we may act as, we, as though we believe that old assumption. Sometimes we make sexist remarks. Sometimes we use sexist language. Sometimes we fall back on the prerogatives of our own sex in order to get what we want. But it's not our intent to discriminate on the basis of gender. It's not consistent with our beliefs for us to discriminate on the basis of gender. It's not the way we want to run our lives. It's our intent that we treat all people fairly and that we create a workplace in a, and a world in which others do the same. It's not our intent. It is our intent not to perpetuate to yet another generation the universal belief that men are more valuable than women. This is where the assumption ends, right here. This is where it ends, with us. Every once in a while, I get discouraged. Every once in a while, I start thinking that nothing has changed, that everything is just like it was 51 years ago when I came to live on this planet, and that my career was a complete waste of time and energy, that I've wasted my own life, and what's worse, I've encouraged other people to waste theirs. Nothing changes and nothing will ever change. But most of the time, I don't feel that way. Most of the time, like today, I believe that we've reached a turning point in our history, the point beyond which our efforts are going to outstrip our wildest expectations. That even as we gather in this room, the world is experiencing what Marilyn Ferguson would call a paradigm shift, and that we've been instrumental in helping create that paradigm shift. Everywhere we look today, we see a new belief dawning. And we don't have to rely on our anecdotes and our intuition to tell us that. The research is also telling us that. 20 and 30 years ago, study after study showed that women's output was undervalued, women's management styles were criticized, and that neither women nor men wanted to work for a woman. Today's research shows quite the opposite that secretaries are almost unanimous in their preference for female bosses, that female managers are seen as being equally effective or more effective by their peers, by their subordinates, and by their superiors. I believe that we've created a critical mass of people who would say that we can't judge a book by its gender. Not a majority of people. I'm not completely out of touch with reality, but a critical mass. And this is how I think it happened. For centuries, women and men have been pretty good sports about the work roles and family roles they've been playing. 
There's always been small rebellions, boys who played girls' games, girls who wore boys' clothes, men who nurtured, women who ran businesses. And sometimes there were dramatic rebellions, like the witches of the Middle Ages. And sometimes there were sensational rebels, like Joan of Arc. But by and large, humans have adhered pretty well to the norms of their society. Males doing those things that were defined as masculine, and females doing those things that were defined as feminine. It didn't always make sense to the individual, but it seemed to make some sort of sense to the society at large. It appeared to be logical that women, the people who could bear and feed the children, would stay home and nurture them. And since they were home anyway, they could look after the house. And since they were nurturing anyway, they could nurture the men as well. Women didn't get paid directly for doing these things, and in fact, in many cases, men didn't get paid directly for their work either. But in the ideal scenario, men went out into the world and earned something that could be exchanged for other goods. And women were supported financially by their husbands, their fathers, their brothers, or their sons. Now, this was no free lunch, however. For women became, in most countries, the legal chattels of their men. It wasn't very many centuries ago in most of Europe, for instance, that rape of a woman was punishable by rape of the rapist's wife or sister or mother. But where the system worked the way it was intended to work, all men were employed, women and children were financially supported by their men and protected by their men, women didn't get raped or beaten, and women looked after the house and nurtured its inhabitants. And soon paid occupations began to follow the same lines, and women's socially acceptable skills of helping housekeeping and caretaking and nurturing were translated into paid jobs. These positions as nurses, secretaries, housekeepers, and nannies didn't pay as well as men's work did, because by definition, women's work was less worth less than men's work. And then in the 19th century, and gaining momentum in the 20th century, came the suffragettes and the people who supported their cause. The name suffragettes suggests that they wanted suffrage, wanted the vote. And the diminutive nature of their name suggests that they weren't very well respected. But their mandate extended far beyond the vote. It's just that they were wise enough to realize that political power and education were important for the emancipa emancipation of women. And today we know that those women were certainly deserving of our respect. They risked their reputations, the reputations of their families, their physical comfort, and sometimes their lives for those beliefs. And what they did benefited them much less than it's benefited us. So women gained the right to vote and to go to university, and there were two world wars. And women played many male roles in those war days, only it wasn't called sex role liberation in those days, it was called supporting the war effort. And then World War II was over. And there was a massive movement to get women out of the factories and out of the offices and back into the home. And it, for about 20 years, it looked like that was going to work. And then came the hippies, and then came Betty Friedan, and finally came women and men in large numbers who were entering occupations and experimenting with family roles that were seen as completely inappropriate for their sex. What has been written and said about these people has created a half century's worth of books and monographs and journals and magazine articles and newspaper reports and radio and television shows and university lectures and cocktail party chatter. And after 26 years of working in the area of sex and gender, I feel like I'm finally getting a handle on what's been happening. It seems to me that the arguments we've heard for and against sex role liberation appear to fall along two distinct continua of belief, as you'll see in that little handout, a continuum of sex differences versus a similarity, a continuum of similarity, um, I'm sorry, a continuum of sex differences versus similarity of women and, and men, and a continuum of individuality versus oneness. Let's look first at the differences-similarities continuum. 
A continuum that ranges on the one end from females and males are completely different at one end of the continuum to females and males are completely alike in all ways except their sex organs, their sex hormones, and their reproductive functions at the other end of the continuum. Using this approach, writers and teachers and people at cocktail parties have examined the ways in which females and males do and do not differ. And most of this research and writing and discussion has been positioned at the differences end of the continuum. We've examined the ways in which males and females differ anatomically, hormonally, physiologically, and reproductively. We've also examined social differences, the ways in which females and males behave at various ages and in various social situations. We've studied the ways we treat males and females differently and the ways in which this differential treatment creates greater social differences. From this perspective has grown courses on gender and work and the psychology of sex differences and the sociology of women. And through this work, a new phrase was born, the phrase different but equal. But the quest for different but equal could never be realized as long as males were more valuable and more important than females were. We seemed to be approaching everything from a distorted kind of angle. We decided to free women by embarking on a massive international project to make girls more like boys and women more like men. We taught girls how to play team sports just like boys do. We taught women how to manage organizations just like men do. And we taught women how to train in military colleges and fight in wars just like men do. But we didn't teach our boys how to crochet. And to our shame, we didn't teach our girls either. We learned about the differences, and we embarked upon change. But our assumption of male superiority remained intact. And just like it always had, the assumption drove our process of socialization. We had taken one small step beyond the belief that girls weren't good enough to do boy things and that women weren't competent enough to do masculine things. But true liberation means that that which is traditionally feminine is good. Good for women and, and girls and good for men and boys. And we hadn't, as a culture, come anywhere near that conclusion. It wasn't long before feminists realized that the differences approach wasn't working very well. And some of us began to shift over to the females and males are similar end of the continuum, focusing on the myriad similarities of males and females instead of the few differences. Part of that shift required us to use the process of socialization to explain the gender differences that we'd already unearthed. And so now we said, we're the same, except we're our physical bodies make us different and where we've been taught to be different. And if males and females differ only in physical ways, if we can teach girls to be masculine and boys to be feminine, then every girl and every boy can double their potential. But again we failed to reckon with the assumption that males are superior to females. If the similarity between the sexes is the ideal, and if men are superior to women, then the obvious way for the sexes to become more similar is for females to become more like males. And so we flipped back and forth along the similarities differences continuum, always treasuring our basic belief in male superiority. Then there's the second continuum that describes the way we've approached sex role issues, the continuum of individuality versus oneness. At the end of this, con one end of this continuum is the me generation. The individual is all important and responsibility to self is the only responsibility that any of us need to acknowledge. On the other end of the continuum is the position of oneness or unity. The notion that we are all one, all inextricably intertwined and that the actions of any one individual has an impact on the action of others. Let's look at these two positions separately and see what happens if we continue to believe that men are more valuable than women. On the individuality end of the continuum is the belief that everyone has the right and the responsibility to follow an individual star. 
From this stance, there should be no sexist hiring, no sexist promotions, no sexist treatment of any kind. Each person has a unique set of personal characteristics. But when we believe that there are some individuals, male individuals, who are more valuable than others, women's quest for individuality takes her more often into masculine roles than does man's quest take him into feminine fields. On the other end of the individuality oneness continuum, at the unity or oneness stance, responsibility flows back and forth from the individual to the group. And no one is independent of the universe, all for one and one for all. For some of us, this means sisterhood for all women. For some of us, this means uh, oneness as a broader concept, encompassing women and men and children all over the world. For some of us, oneness is broader still and includes every living creature and entity in the universe. In any case, the focus has been the, the joining of forces to create freedom a freedom that includes sex role liberation, equally sought by all people, for all people. But as long as the basic assumption of male superiority has prevailed, women, who tend to be somewhat more practiced at self-sacrifice than men do, have been those most often set upon the altar of the common good. And so the battle of pay equity, or equal pay for work of equal value, is still raging in the 90s in a recession society that cannot possibly afford to pay women their worth. So we've looked at two continua, the differences similarities continuum and the individuality oneness continuum. Now these two continua have always coexisted and I've only separated them for clarity and, and uh, for convenience. But now let's combine them again in the second handout to form a matrix. First of all, the differences individuality quadrant. When we combine a differences perspective with individuality, we focus on the uniqueness of women, the uniqueness of each individual woman, the uniqueness of men, and the uniqueness of each individual man. Women share similarities with each other, and men share similarities with each other, but males and females differ dramatically. Each person, female or male, is an island. A similarities individuality perspective honors the commonalities of women and men, but sees people as independent and as responsible only to themselves. Gender is relevant only in anatomical and physiological ways, and everyone must and should follow his or her own path. In the differences oneness quadrant, we focus on the differences between females and males, and women and men are asked to combine their unique talents for the betterment of humanity. <coughs> by helping to free individuals from their roles. Finally, in the combination of similarities and oneness, all we creatures are seen as one. One body comprised of similar parts working together for the common goal of respect and equality between the sexes. Now let's try to fit this model together. And let's begin by incorporating the four quadrants into a three-dimensional figure, which I'm going to describe in two dimensions. First, I've drawn a matrix at the bottom of the tower and labeled the bottom of that tower, men are more important and more valuable than women. From the ends of each axis of the matrix runs a line and the four lines meet at the top of the tower. And the top of the tower is labeled women and men are of equal value. The bottom of the tower is a static position. And that's the, position, that's the position that we get caught in 
when a, we keep switching from one position to the other and we feel like we're going around in circles. But I don't believe that that's what's happening. We are not a static society. This is merely theoretical. What's really happening is that gradually we're rejecting the assumption of male superiority. And as we reject this assumption, step by step and bit by bit, the position of these four stances begins to rise. It begins to climb the tower. And now, when we return to an earlier stance, we find it at a higher level. A higher level than it was a year or a week earlier, and we approach it with greater insight and greater sophistication. And as we're slowly discarding the assumption that males are more valuable than females, we look at every argument from a slightly more liberated position. So the argument that men and women are different has a more complex and insightful meaning than it has ever had before. For the first time, it includes the possibility that we might honor those differences, that females and males might have something to teach each other. The discussion sounds familiar, but it comes from a different place, from a higher place, and it's received in a different place. And the circle becomes a cycle. And as we spiral upward from stance to stance, moving from an assumption of male superiority to an ideal of female-male equality, as we climb the tower, another phenomenon occurs. The stances appear to be less and less distant until finally it becomes clear that the four stances aren't really the extremes of two continua at all, but are four separate concepts that can easily coexist. All we need to make it happen is a belief in male-female equality, in the belief in female-male equality, a belief in the equality of all human beings. I believe that we've reached a crucial point in that climb. I believe that we've acquired a critical mass of people who cherish the value of females, the things that girls and women do, and all things feminine. And I believe that each of us in our own way has helped shift world consciousness up that tower. We've done millions of little things that our parents in their wildest fantasies could never have imagined themselves doing. We've said things that our parents in their bravest teenage dreams could not have imagined themselves saying. And even better, We've done and said things that half our own lifetimes ago we could never have thought possible. We're making tremendous progress. We've just got to keep going. We've got to keep puttering along. It's going to be easier now. For the first time, and in many places, the evidence mounts. Somewhere on our trip up the tower, we created a paradigm shift. We see it everywhere, in art, in organizations, in the family. We're beginning to place a higher value on women's traditional art form, the craft. Quilting, weaving, embroidering, flower arranging, smocking, tatting, women's work. It's being honored in ways that it's never been honored before in written history in shops, in competitions, in art galleries, and in homes. Women's volunteerism is finally being recognized as having a value beyond money. The entrepreneurial styles for which women have become famous are being lauded today. Start small with as much of your own money as you can afford and do what you love to do. As women feel more and more free to be themselves, to manage as they feel comfortable in managing, women's management styles are being applauded also, and many smart men are learning about these styles and following them. 
and in the home, parents everywhere are steering their children away from violent, competitive sports and into lifetime sports. Child care, a chronic issue for every employed mother, is beginning to be reconceptualized in some families as a family issue, in some organizations as a corporate issue, and in some governments as a social issue. I don't think Playboy or Outdoor Life has run any articles on the topic yet, but I think we'll live to see that. Because our path has finally led us over the mountain. There's a women's political party in Iceland which having gained lost ground in the 1980s is gaining ground again. And it's going to be a major contender in the next federal election. Rare is the parent today who believes that formal education for boys is more important than formal education for girls. When I was a child, that was a given. I didn't know a parent who felt differently. It's been a long time since newspapers ran ads entitled Male Help Wanted and Female Help Wanted. But I was in my mid-twenties and I had applied for dozens of jobs before that practice was made illegal. And for a year after this source of discrimination was finally banned, newspapers ran apologies every time they ran ads, apologizing to their customers that they had to ferret the jobs that were appropriate for their sex out of this long list of occupations. Until finally, the government made them stop doing that as well. Few managers would dare to call their secretaries my girl today. But not only was I called my girl by my boss, I actually did the same thing myself. I called the woman who cleaned my house my girl. In the past decades, we've seen sex role heroes by the thousands, carving out a world that's a little bit better than the world in which they were born, fighting in the courts, standing their ground, entering new territory, revamping old relationships, teaching their girls to be strong, teaching their boys to be gentle. Today, I hope you'll give some thought to what I believe to be a turning point in our history, the history of women and men on this planet. All the issues we've dealt with in the past are going to have to be reconceptualized. Not everyone we know is going to be in the same position on the tower. We're going to have to be able to view these issues from many different heights, to see them as they're seen by people at all stages on their way up the tower. In the next decade, we're going to see organizations and families operating on a completely new concept, a concept that no known culture has ever entertained before, the notion that we cannot place value on people on the basis of their gender. What are these organizations and these families going to look like? How will we reconceptualize them? Will the division of labor by sex disappear? How will leadership change? How will the relationship between work and family change? And how can we help? Well, we're going to have to continue to refuse to participate in the derision of men who are ridiculed because their voices or their gestures or their interests or their occupations are considered to be feminine. We're going to have to encourage men who take on family roles and who apply for female-dominated occupations. We're going to have to applaud them just as we've applauded female engineers and female transport drivers and female mechanics. And we're going to have to do this even if we're scared that they're going to take jobs away from women. We're going to have to ensure that the family policies of our organizations and our governments are supportive of parents and that they're just as supportive of fathers as they are of mothers. And if men who try to utilize these policies are ridiculed, we're going to have to be vocal in our protestation of their treatment. And we're going to have to support women who choose to behave in traditionally feminine ways. Because as long as we devalue that which is feminine, 
whether it's the behavior of women or the behavior of men, we're postponing our own liberation. We have many reasons to be proud of the roles that we've played as women and as men. We found our own way to the path and we stuck to it. We may have rambled occasionally, individually and collectively, and we certainly stumbled, but we've never turned back. Maybe now we could stop and have a picnic once in a while. We don't want to forget where we're going, but maybe once in a while we could sit down and pull out some fine cheese and a bottle of wine and we could toast ourselves. Sisters and brothers, we could say. We're getting there. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any comments? There's a mic at the back. Oh, this is going to be an easy one. <laughs> I was just wondering, in, in light of, the, of your background, whether you could comment ab about a little bit more detail about what you're seeing uh, in, in informal organizations in the workplace, particularly uh, in light of the restructuring and economic, uh, you know, economic re uh, mm -hmm. restructuring we're seeing in the last few years. Yeah. So much depends on industry, but one of the, a group of us were talking today about one of the sad things that's happening in universities where women were the last hired. And as long as the culling is done by the bottom up, um, that's going to have an impact on women. One of, the, one of the phenomena that has occurred over the past decade actually started about 15 years ago and is seems to be gaining um, momentum is women going into entrepreneurship. The, the rate of women in entrepreneurship is much greater than the rate of men and their success rate is better. Part of the reason I think is the style that women tend to have that the research indicates that women tend to have to start small with as much money of their own as they can manage and to do what they love. Um, if I were a prophet, I would suggest that that's going to happen more and more. Now, there has been research that shows that, that women have been leaving large corporations in large numbers because of many reasons other than, um, than reshuffling of the organization, that they've decided that they just don't want to play the game the way the game is being played. There's other research that's beginning to show, though, that this may be a temporary phenomenon, that women are going in and out. So they may use entrepreneurship as a way to gain experience rather than taking on a new occupation in another organization that will put them up one step. There seems to be a phenomenon, and there's a little bit of research that shows that, that this is an actual phenomenon and not just anecdotal evidence. There seems to be a phenomenon that women look many places for their experience. That women look to the family for their experience. They, look, they may look to entrepreneurship, and that they're more willing to make lateral moves in order to gain experience. Um, so, yes, I think there are lots of dangers if women want to 
rise in the hierarchy in exactly the same way that men have, have r risen in the hierarchy for the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years, more. However, this flexibility that women are beginning to show, because they never really got into the model, perhaps, they weren't around long enough to buy the model wholesale, perhaps they're going to come up with many more innovative ways of dealing with this situation than men have been able to do. And perhaps they will not be as devastated when they're laid off and are looking for, for new ways of dealing with their lifestyle and new ways of, of maintaining their self-esteem. I know quite a few people in Winnipeg who work in a program for reorienting managers who have um, been laid off, middle managers who have been laid off. And what they, they say that the prognosis for women in these groups tends to be a lot better than the prognosis for men. And one of the reasons they believe is that men have, have seen generations of men before them going through a process where you get into a company and slowly you're promoted and eventually you're going to be at the top or, or near, as near the top as your capabilities will allow and then you retire. And women just haven't had long enough to identify with that model. And so the people that I've talked to in this area say, maybe that's good. And maybe that's going to um, give women a flexibility that they can teach men about how to deal with this new world that's moving so fast that none of us knows what to do. Virginia O'Leary's been doing a lot of research. Oh, I'm sorry, Hill. <laughs> um, Virginia O'Leary's been doing a lot of research in this area. I don't know. If, I met her at a conference in England. I don't know if she's published any of it yet. But you might want, if you're interested in in those data, you might want to write to her. But she's been involved in a large project over many years, studying this, and I think it's going to sh show some really exciting findings. Um, do you mean more women coming into it or, and the salaries dropping? <laughs> um, Gl Gloria Steinem once said that an occupation, the value of an occupation drops like the value of a neighborhood when more than one third of it becomes female. Um, we saw it happen. Um, we saw the opposite happen in teaching and nursing. That when, when I was a student, there were two unions. There was the female teachers union and the male teachers union. And um, as women started getting into high school and as men started getting into elementary school, um, they decided to do away with those two unions. And things started evening out more, and women started getting the salaries that men got. Um, in nursing, men went into nursing and the salaries raised. Um, one area that women are going into, or two areas, engineering and, um, and computers, that has not happened, but I would agree, and many others it is. And as long as we as a culture buy that basic assumption, um, I can't see that it's going to be any different. The, as men start going into more female-dominated occupations, that might change. However, there is no, um, no known female-dominated occupation that has the same status as what we like to think is a comparable male-dominated occupation, an occupation that requires the same amount of education, for instance. Hillary, Hillary Lips, who is a colleague of mine and who many of you have read and know, once did a study in which she was trying 
to set up um, a scenario to get people to evaluate. And what she needed was a high status and a low status male dominated occupation and a high status and a low status female dominated occupation. She worked for one year trying to get a female dominated occupation that tested out high status. She assumed that librarians would because they require so much education. Not a chance. Finally, in order to do this study, she had to create an occupation that she named, I can't remember what she named it. It was something in the computer industry and she had to make up a name for it, make up the job, and tell people that it was female dominated. And so then she had to do it for the other three occupations as well. So she couldn't, in any kind of a natural setting, do this study that she wanted to do. She had to create these make-believe occupations. Um, so it's, that was about 10 years ago. It's, it's not something that is going to change rapidly, I don't think. Um, but as, as many other phenomena, like the one that was just discussed, um, it's hitting our society simultaneously. Um, it's very hard to isolate just one of those variables, isn't it? It's, it's really getting to be a very, very complex situation. And as simplistic as it sounds, I think this is the only answer, that somehow we're going to have to keep shifting our, our assumptions up, up the tower. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of everyone here tonight, I'd like to thank Nina for her presentation. It was insightful, it was encouraging, and uh, hopefully it'll help us get up the tower a little quicker. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will. Oh, and